This is Michael Goodfriend, executive producer of the Play On podcast. What Shakespeare is to theater, J.R.R. Tolkien is to fantasy. And I've got a podcast to recommend if you've ever wanted to read The Lord of the Rings or anything in Middle Earth, The Prancing Pony Podcast. Every week, your hosts, Alan and Sean, explore the works of J.R.R. Tolkien, bringing along plenty of pop culture references, nerd humor, and a few bad puns. They cover a few pages each week, taking a deep dive into your favorite stories. And while longtime readers still learn from the Prancing Pony podcast, they're also very welcoming to newcomers. So, if you're ready to dive into the most beloved world in fantasy literature and become a part of a vibrant, active community of listeners, Look for the Prancing Pony podcast wherever you listen. Hi, I'm Michael Goodfriend, and I'm the executive producer of the Play On Podcasts. King Lear is such a complicated, intricate story. You can watch it over and over again. You can hear it over and over again, and there will still be things that you learn every time you see or hear this play. It's especially complex in our day and age. I wanted to talk to somebody who really knows this play inside and out. Not just this play, but who also knows the person who translated it very well, Marcus Gardley. That person, Dr. Philippa Kelly, is resident dramaturg for the California Shakespeare Theater and resident dramaturg for Napa Shakes. Her dramaturgy credits include the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, the Aurora Theater, and Word for Word. Dr. Kelly is chair and professor of English at the California Jazz Conservatory and professor at various University of California campuses, including Berkeley and Santa Cruz. She's published a ton of books, articles, and online materials. And the closest to her heart is called The King and I a monograph that explores Australian culture and history through the lens of King Lear. She's received tons of awards, including the Fulbright, the Walter and Eliza Hall, Rockefeller and Commonwealth Fellowships, and has also received fellowships from universities, including Australian National University, Oxford University. I'll stop there. I could go on and on. I wanted to bring her into this room today to talk about the play on podcast series, King Lear. Philippa, welcome. It's great to have you with me today. Thank you, Michael. And as always, it's really wonderful to see you. If I don't see you as an actor, it's lovely to see you as an interviewer. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Philippa, tell us about what it's like working on a translation of King Lear with the likes of Marcus Cardley? Well, uh, for a start, it's a play that I've always been sort of obsessed with. Um, it's a play that every person in the world can have a really direct relationship with because in a sense, it's about that visceral feeling of abandonment, of being shut out. Um, Lear, of course, engineers the means by which he is shut out of the world as he knew it, which so many of us do. We'll make these, you know, catastrophic errors or misjudgments or, or misperceptions, and suddenly we will be outside on the heath. I want to yeah. ask you, yeah. we, we use that word heath, but it's not at that. We don't use that in common English. What What is the heath? Oh, so the heath is um, the not just the forest, but it's the outdoors away from structure, comfort, rules. It's the place where you are subject to the wind and the rain, um, the thunder, the lightning, all of the things that you can't control. All so it's, can it's, it's the great equalizer in a sense. Anybody who's on the heath exposed to nature is in the same reality. 
Yes, and, and in fact, when I first got to know Louis Douthat, I would tell we would talk about, you know, our emotional lives as you do when you get to know somebody well. And I would say, you know, my experience, this is an experience I'm having right now. I'm on the heath. And Louis would say exactly what you said. What's the heath? The heath is so um internalized for me that I sort of forgot that 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 it's not um a ubiquitous expression today. So yeah, what I mean by the heath is when you are exposed, abandoned, alone, um, all of the things that Lear is when he gives away everything he's known and every comfort that he's had, not knowing that that would expose him to the elements. And so then when Louis and I got talking, she felt like Marcus and I would have a great deal to talk about. I then met him actually at a function to do with Black Odyssey, which he uh, was his play that was staged at um, at Cal Shakes. No longer could the soldier afford to be stuck, hoodwinked, bamboozled, nor run amok. He sells on with benevolence. Say, do you know what it's like to lose your kin? To be ripped from your mother's arms, snatched from your father's hands, to be taken from your motherland? Slave! That was a wonderful production. We just got talking. The next day, he wrote and said, you know, I'd love to work with you on this project. And so our partnership in this project was sort of was born. Um, but just to get back to the Heath for a moment, I wanted to say that... Um, that where I find that really powerful as a bridge between, you know, 1605 and 2022 is that when you look at Shakespeare's uh, time, there was very little emotional vocabulary as we know it today. So self-centered, narcissistic, um, self-deprecating, all those words were not in parlance. And so the elements became a really important kind of um, existential vocabulary for Shakespeare. And you see it so powerfully in King Lear because this elderly man, actually two elderly men, are forced out through their own folly, which we so often as human beings are, forced out into the elements, a world they can't control. and a word that becomes incredibly important for both of them is patience. And in that time, patience meant capacity to endure. And so what we see is that the triumph of this journey for both these two characters is their capacity to endure and finally to beg for benediction, where neither of them has thought that they would ever have to beg for anything. That is a remarkable uh, way of seeing it and, and something that never occurred to me. Can you talk about why Lear and Australia come together for you, how they come together for you in your lived experience? Yes, that, that's a lovely question, Michael. Um, I was introduced to King Lear as basically the first Shakespeare play that I ever uh, was exposed to. And uh, as you know, many people in their lives have been fortunate enough to have a school teacher who brought that play alive for them. And so I began my thinking about King Lear at the age of, you know, 14, 15, and What's remarkable about that play is that as you grow and as you are exposed to more and more of life's experiences and, and as you create your own experiences and your own mistakes um, and as you learn to, to understand what it is to be ignored or snubbed or all of the things that are part of being human as, as well as being loved, then King Lear takes on, I think, a deeper and deeper resonance. And so as an Australian, uh, my mother on her side is the direct descendant, seven generations removed, 
from convicts. So both of her antecedents on her mother's and father's side came out to Australia. Um, basically, they were, you know, two of the uh, poverty-stricken English people thrown out of England for being poor. And because because the, Australia was really a penal colony for, for Great Britain, right? Is that right? Yes. And, and, and Australia took over once um, America was a place, um, you know, because of the revolution and, 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 and America was a place that England could no longer use as its poverty-stricken dumping ground, Australia became that. So that's how my ancestors got to Australia. And so I feel myself very much as um, connected to that history, not just through my mother, but through the way that um, Australians perceive the world and their relationship to it. And, and I don't mean simply, um, oh, we are convicts and rejects and whatever. What I mean is that when we look at Australian society, there are all kinds of what I call outcastings that you can see uh, that underscore the history of Australia. We were outcast from England and then the colonial settlers um, specialised in destroying and outcasting Aboriginal culture, which is truly today Australia's shame. And then looking at all kinds of aspects of Australian society, a society that I know so well, when you look at it through the prism of a play like King Lear, what I feel is that you get a distance as well as this incredible kaleidoscopic familiarity. And so you come to observe aspects of your own culture and aspects of who you are as a citizen of the world that brings Australia very much for me into focus with uh, other experiences of Leah and what that means both personally and societally. How old were you when you first encountered King Lear, the play? Uh, 13. And we used to watch an episode per day. They had a television um, uh, episode of, of, of a, a, tel a telecast of, of King Lear. And, and each day we would watch a different scene and were really encouraged to Think of this play not as um, in terms of the, the mega or meta themes, but on a very personal level, what it feels like to be cold, to be shivering, not just physically, but having been outcast from people you thought you knew and who you thought were your own people. This is an experience that 13-year-olds understand possibly more deeply than people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, because when you're 13, your society is everything. And being cast out is what every young teenager fears. So that's how I first met King Lear. And you found comfort in the story? I loved it. Um, I felt that um, it, and I still feel today, that it is a play that, I mean, listening to your beautiful interview with Marcus, I really, um, I loved the way that Marcus talked about his family, his father, and his father's journey with Alzheimer's. Wherever you are, in life, it feels like it doesn't take too much of a shifting of the needle to find some identification with Leah. And it's not because I want to, um, you know, suggest or to vocalize the idea that, oh, yes, Shakespeare is 
universal because I think that idea is being rightfully challenged in all kinds of ways at the moment. But I think it's because King Lear deals so directly in metaphors that are both incredibly physical, the shivering, the thunder, the cold, the blasted heath, and also uh, metaphorical, existential in the mind. This is Michael Goodfriend, executive producer of the Play On Podcasts. If you're looking for another great podcast for book nerds, check out Borrowed from Brooklyn Public Library. It's a narrative show about superhero librarians, Brooklyn neighborhood stories, and what it means to be a free democratic space in a changing world. Just search for Borrowed in your podcast app of choice, or listen on the web at bklynlibrary.org slash podcasts. Philippa, you are chair and professor of English at the California Jazz Conservatory. Does that mean that you know a lot about jazz? Actually, no. I I love teaching at the Jazz Conservatory um, where everybody's major is is of course jazz and, and music um but what i love about teaching there is that i feel that uh, in a sense jazz was one of the original forms of musical connection and it's been co-opted from by white people all over the place but when you look at the origins of jazz it is black american culture and i love that that marcus i think really feels that connection and wanted to make for the podcast and for um his upcoming production with cult shakes wanted to make jazz music uh really foundational to the world that he set his lear in. Does does that work? Do you think it works? At listening to the podcasts now, do you feel like the jazz supports the story? I really do. And I mean, I feel that music has a form of connection that transcends literal language. Music is, in a sense, metaphor, just as much as music is also math. And what I love about what I've been listening to with the podcast is that the, the, the jazz underscore really creates part of the sense of both community and alienation from a long history that I think is part of the legacy that jazz music carries today. You talked about how King Lear entered into your life. Can you talk about how King Lear entered into Shakespeare's life Mm. at the time that he was writing it? Do you know what was going on for him at that time? Uh, Well, yes. And, and, you know, I'd also say if anybody wants to take a look at a really good book on Lear, have a look at James Shapiro's The Year of Lear. But I'll just say more broadly, um, Lear was written sometime between 1604 and 1606. So around 1605, King James had just come down from Scotland to take the throne because Elizabeth I died without an heir. And so this play king lear was incredibly revolutionary for shakespeare to write Uh, so shakespeare has sort of two lines of inquiry and challenge in this play the first being that the play actually suggests that a king should never give away his kingdom, his property, and that if he does, chaos will ensue. But it also suggests something that was incredibly um, risky and even foolhardy, although Shakespeare seems to have weathered it, which was that in a time when both Elizabeth and James had insisted 
on the code of divine right, which meant that, as with today's Pope, the idea that God had ordained this particular queen and this particular king. In that time, Shakespeare is suggesting that a king, thou should not have been old until thou hadst been wise, that a king is actually just a man, not anointed, not ordained, but just a human being. And so what's really beautiful about this play is the paradox that every king is just a man and every human being is a king until life tells us, whether it be at two months, two years, 20 or four score years and upward, that every human being is a king until we're told that we're not. Had Elizabeth died at the time that he began writing this? Yes. So Elizabeth died in 1603. James took the throne in 1603. And so we know that the first version of this play was actually played in front of James. And so there were uh, things like that he then changed um, in the folio version. But in the initial version, he had, for instance, um, you shall not touch me for queening. I am the king himself, which was a direct allusion to King James's incredibly spend for thrift ways. James was a great spender, so much so that more money apparently had to be coined. So in the folio version for the general public, that line is changed to, you cannot touch me for crying, I am the king himself. So Shakespeare was always so aware of his audience. And I just think it's when you think of the, the, the king, so he would sit on his throne watching the performance and all of the rest of the audience was called the auditory. And they their job was to watch the king watching the performance. So imagine this risky play being staged with the king on his throne watching this and perhaps some of the audience not knowing whether he would be thrilled at the idea of um, the chaos that ensues when a king gives up his kingdom or whether he would be insulted at the suggestion that the king is a mere human being. And if he's insulted, Shakespeare loses his head in those days, right? Yes. Well, his ear or his hand. But Shakespeare brilliantly said it in ancient Britain so that it was so it removed so far in terms of the centuries that uh, he could always argue if need be that this was not actually regular London the only play of his set in a, in the particular time and place of London in the 1590s was actually The Merry Wives of Windsor. Every other play is set elsewhere in terms of either time or place or both. That is amazing. So ancient Britain, I never knew that, that that's when King Lear is actually set. Mm -hmm. and, and how was ancient Britain different from what was then Shakespeare's contemporary Britain? Well, in Shakespeare's time, Parliament was beginning to have more and more of a voice um, and actually King James had a real problem with Parliament because he didn't want the voice of the people to be in any way threatening his own. So by setting this play in ancient Britain away from the perceived threat of Parliament, there was uh, the idea that the king was supreme. And so it really kind of fit beautifully into the Aristotelian notion of what makes a tragedy, a person with greatness who through a flaw or a folly uh, sinks or dives from a great height to a depth. And the capacity to be great is I think not to not have faults, but to be able to 
arouse pity and fear in other people and in oneself. So to be able to see that fall and to come away from it, seeing the world a little bit differently. So for instance, we might have um, you know, various politicians who might like to have the prerogative of a king, but who do not have the insight or the perspective to have the capacity to see what that journey, that fall can mean in terms of human growth and learning. What Joseph Campbell says, the hero's journey, right? The, the fall from grace going down into the depths of despair and then returning with that perspective was something that, that was familiar to Shakespeare's audience at that time? Yes, and Shakespeare was doing something quite uh, revolutionary. So if you think of the, the sort of theatre that preceded Shakespeare, uh, well, one of the, 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 the great ones is Everyman, and actually Brandon Jacobs Jenkins uh, adapted that into Everybody, which is a play that's often performed now. That kind of play relied on or it, it was scaffolded by character stereotypes. So you'd have the devil or the angelic creature or, um, or um, you know, good things or um, kinds of characterological stereotypes which were aspects of human nature. And so those aspects were played out on stage in order generally to teach a story. Because remember at that time, the direct competitor to theatre was the church and the companion to theatre was the church. And as society moved onward, there were discoveries like the Copernican universe, the idea of uh, the universe being heliocentric. There were journeys uh, to discover lands that had never been uh, pilfered before. There was all kinds of riches that were brought back to Europe. And so because of that, there, was, there were new understandings of the world, including the mysteries that had just had not been in general consciousness before. And because of that, there came to be much more of an insecurity about what the world was, what human beings' journey was. There was the birth of capitalism, of individuality. In Shakespeare's time, the word individual still meant you and I are indivisible. It also meant individual as, as we know it, as in um, a, a single uh, aspirant spirit. But it's incredible to think it meant both of those things at that time. And so England was, was on its own journey toward understanding the individual, not just in terms of the feudal top-down society where God, king, um, nobles, you know, uh, cobblers, etc., but in terms of the individual as making a unique journey through life. When you say indivisible, so you and I, in the original sense of the word individual, being indivisible from God or from each other? From each other. You and so, I, you, you, Philippa Kelly, and I, Michael Goodfriend, are indivisible. indivisible. We are individual. Yes. And also, it meant my individual self, my aspirant, unique spirit. So that kind, I love that, that thought because it really suggests the sort of um, turning point or the point of a word we use a lot now, pivoting that society was at the crossroads and of course Hamlet straddles that so 
evocatively. But so does Leah. Imagine this character, this man, who's had every kind of power you can imagine. The only thing that he can't control is the knock of death at the door. And he doesn't want to go on that journey toward that bourne, which Hamlet tells us, from which no traveller returns. He doesn't want to go there alone. And that's what brings up that whole initial first scene of King Lear. He simply wants his youngest daughter to say how much she loves him and to accompany him on that journey. To give him relevance. That yes. her, her saying, I love you more than anything, Will make him gives him the courage to go to death well he has to go to death and he's not used to things um, that he hasn't chosen and so because of that he wants this you know the whole court is set up for cordelia to say how much she loves him and he's going to then hand her the best portion so what he experiences there there is not just abandonment but public shaming and so that's why he reacts with so much rage throws her out of the court throws out of the court kent or anyone else who in any way speaks back to him but what he hasn't understood is that this is also the day on which cordelia is supposed to be choosing a husband and so he basically says to both of the suitors, um, she's got no dowry, she's new adopted to our hate, um, take her if you want her, never expecting that one of them will actually want her without a dowry because alliances, particularly regal ones at that time, were all about the matching of dynasties rather than just human beings. And so here he is, he's created this situation that's going to be his triumph, but in actuality is just too shameful for him to bear. So that he thinks that when he throws Cordelia out, he can get some control back again, quickly halves the kingdom between the two other daughters. And as the fool tells him a little further on, what he's done there is to cut an egg in half and to leave nothing in the middle, just two empty shells of his former power. That concludes the first part of my interview with Philippa Kelly. We'll pick up with part two next week. This is Michael Goodfriend, executive producer of The Play On Podcasts. If you're enjoying these podcasts, then I think you'll also really enjoy a podcast that I've come to love called The Stacks. It's a podcast about books and the people who read them. Creator and host Tracy Thomas interviews best-selling and emerging authors, along with other book lovers from the worlds of literature and entertainment. Past guests include Quentin Tarantino, Angelina Jolie, James McBride, and Britt Bennett. Their conversations explore the classics and new titles in fiction, nonfiction, and poetry with monthly book club discussions on the show. A special miniseries on banned books featured people who were impacted by the controversial bannings, ranging from students to educators, authors, and more. Listen to The Stacks every Wednesday, wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>